Hello and welcome to Waltrip Unfiltered, another great show. I'm so happy you tuned in. And I have to tell you this because it's in my script. We ask that you please tell your friends to add us on their favorite podcast app. I don't need to tell you that because obviously you found us, but you have friends and we want you to share this wonderful program with them so more people will listen and we can do this forever and a day because I love it. I love not only talking about current events in NASCAR, but mainly the most fun I've had is getting to know the young racers, guys that were born after I won my first race and ask them not what they remember about that, because obviously they didn't, but, but their influences, what the sport was like to them as kids growing up, and how they wound up on the big stage in one of the top series of NASCAR winning races. Today's guest is exactly an example of that, Justin Haley. He's done a great job in NASCAR. He won the k n Championship. He won truck races. He was destined to win an Xfinity race way before he ever won a cup race. Well, as you might know, that didn't work out that way. So it's going to be really fun to talk to Justin about that. And by the way, I don't know if you've seen him yet, but Justin is sitting right here. I don't know how uncomfortable it is for him to hear me talk about him with him sitting here and not being able to say anything. But the reason why he's here, and I'm starting the show this way, is because I announced earlier this week that there's going to be a documentary about my racing career, how I started, and mainly about the day that I won the Daytona 500 and my dear friend and car owner, Dale Earnhardt, died in that same race. And it was announced on September 6th in New York City and Los Angeles. The movie will be released. And then on the 12th after that, in theaters all across America. So I'm very proud of the project. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of work. But the people that meant the most to me, folks that loved Dale as much as I did, mainly Dale Jr., my, my, my wife, Buffy, um, she's my ex-wife now, but it'd be weird if I didn't say wife because it'd be like, you know, why, why do you care about your ex-wife? But I do. I, I cared what they thought. I cared what the family, the Earnhardt family thought, and everybody loved the project so much. So uh, here's a trailer to our movie. I hope you enjoy it. This is the first race of the year. I'm really concerned about how much tension these guys are feeling. People are obviously capable of handling the highest of highs. Michael Walter leads the Daytona 500. And the lowest of lows. Oh, Sterling got into Earnhardt. The great bomb now. But I don't know. You get it! I get it! I don't know how many people have, um, have had to experience them within seconds of each other. We've lost Dale Earnhardt. Well, third place finish today didn't quite work out. I've been fired 600 times this week. There was no hiding Michael's wins versus losses. It was 0 and 462. People didn't take him as serious as they took other drivers. Whoa, now, Mikey, come on, man. Ah! But you know, I never lost confidence in him. I mean, that man is a survivor. And then you got Dale Earnhardt, whose name is The Intimidator. And the guy tries to cut you off, you stand your ground. We're building the biggest and greatest racing team in NASCAR. Dale looked at me and he said, I'm going to put Michael in that car because I think he can win. I'm like, Michael who? OK, and here's Michael now. I'd like to add to that. Uh, he They've become great friends. And Michael's going to get the dark cloud off his back. That kept me going, because I knew that one of the best ever believed in me. You can hear the crowd roaring over the sound of the engine. I drove like I've never driven before. These are tears of joy. This isn't what you would expect. I knew I had to be strong. Dale Earnhardt said, I'm a tough son of a bitch. I'll take that. So I tell you, that, that, that 
movie, that experience, my, my life, basically everything sort of evolves around that day for me. And I know you were, you were one. How did that affect you at that time? Well, uh, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it quite did, but looking back on it, um, I think it's definitely one of the, the biggest moments in the sport, um, obviously for you. But I think for a lot of people, it was um, probably the biggest moment in the sport. So um, although I was one, there's a, you know, you still look back for it. I was alive for it. But, right. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, it was it was a it was a tough day. I mean, I don't know. You know, you're you're 20 years old. I, I don't know how many moments in your life yet have been that big, but for me, it, you know, it'll it'll uh, it change me. I'll never I'll never be the same. And 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 saying that, like, there's Daytona. Daytona is a place that it just seems like special, crazy things happen, and you can't really ever define them. As a kid, I used to go there and look at those high banks and think, man, I just want to race on them. And that day in Daytona, for you, I mean, holy cow, congratulations. That that's that was special Yeah, to be was, able to, to do that. It was pretty incredible um, for a lot of people, not only myself, but, um, you know, everyone on the team and, and my family and – Everyone that's put anything into this, you know, even my mentors when I was dirt racing, I think it meant to something to them. So um, it's crazy all the texts you get and and how big it actually is. You know, you you tend to as you move up, you know, your your circle gets smaller and and you tend to um, I don't know not think about everything. So to to just kind of open it up and and get that win and just think about everything, it, it makes you think about life. Yeah, a couple of things that stand out to me. I, I called your Uncle Todd, who I know family. I mean, the reason why you're a racer is your family. They, they supported you and, and helped you become a racer, and, and Uncle Todd's been a big part of that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, he's been pretty much all of it. I mean, obviously my mo- mother has, has been a big support system too, but without Todd's uh, knowledge in, in NASCAR and his knowings of the sport, um, I, I don't think I would have made it too far, so – um, obviously his, uh, his knowledge has been the biggest thing to, to get me to this point. And you know what I love about uncle Todd is I've known him forever. I remember in like 1999 or 2000, they showed up with, with Chip Ganassi cars and Chad Blunt. Was that his name? I believe so. Yeah. yeah I think I, he... I was, I was just being born in 99. So <laughs> sorry don't if I'm ask leaning... me any questions. I'm but... sorry if I'm leaning on you for yeah. your late nineties, early O's. Yeah. Um, but, but I remember, remember your, your uncle being there and of those 20 years, I think one way that I would have never described uncle Todd was enthusiastic. Like he's just so chill, like right down the middle, just a cool, um, analytic, smart guy. You can tell, but I called him after your win in Daytona, and 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 he was indeed enthusiastic and and happy for for you and the family. Uh, and he also said, you know, mom and dad were in, in heaven and and smiling down, watching what happened. And and if there's if there's ever need of a of a rainstorm or or maybe some mother nature um, uh, intervention, maybe it came from mom and dad. That's so cool to hear him say that. Yeah, I I think uh, like you said, there's only a few times any of us has seen uh, Todd Braun any sort of excitement, and I think the Daytona race would be one of them. And and my truck went at Texas last year as well, or, or Gateway. Any any time I win, he gets pretty excited, which is cool for me because it it kind of gives me a reason to keep going. Um, I think a lot of the reason of why I am a race car driver is my grandpa and my and my grandma and and uh, what they've done for my family and I. So kind of. I think every morning I wake up and try to continue on their legacy and, and help build the path to, to kind of what they started. Well, that's special. I, I've told people that you were on the the prescribed path to the Cup Series. I mean, you're, you're a young dirt racer. That was your background. And somehow you're you're also a road racer. Usually a dirt racer and a road racer, you're not, we're not both when you're a kid. And I want to ask you about that, but but I want to tell tell this story. So, you you come you win the K and N championship, which is awesome. Like that's that's amazing accomplishment to be able to win in, at that level. And then you move to the truck series and you win three races there. 
and now you're in the Xfinity series and you're just doing your job. I mean, you've you're the only driver in 2019 in the Xfinity series that has a top 10 in every mile and a half race. Obviously, there's a lot of those. So that that tells you that you as a kid, you're you're really fast on the bigger tracks and that's that's probably the most challenge because there weren't many or any K&N races on the mile and a half. No. So you're able to develop that skill, and, and you've, you've completed 99% of the laps in 2019 in the Xfinity Series. So um, K&N Championship, check. Truck wins, contend for championships, check. Xfinity Series in your first year doing a lot of great things. So you're just making your way through the, tier, the, through the tiers of NASCAR to, to eventually becoming a cup racer. That plan was working perfectly, but you screwed it up. Yeah. I did. <laughs> you won Daytona in in the middle of 2019, in the middle of your rookie season Xfinity. You won Daytona, and I just I, I really want to know this. I want to like I want to hear the the. To me, it's all good. There's nothing bad about it. You did exactly what you were supposed to do. But what has it been like for you, who's been on this path? Oh yeah, I did win Daytona. My fault. I mean, we did everything we're supposed to, and we won. I'm sorry. I know there's people that are oh, complaining about too it. many people. But too about many, it. no doubt. I hate that. But but for you as as a kid, you're like, all right, well, what do you want me to do? You want me to give it back? Yeah. Like, what's it? What's what's it been like? Well, I, I think the biggest thing is is everyone that day saw that I was running thirtieth, um, and that wasn't the case. I mean, the the car isn't the best, right? But it could have run top 10. You think about, go back to Talladega where I made my debut. I mean, we ran top 10 almost all day. There was a point where we were running sixth and seventh, and, and I, I junked the car, and they only have three cars over there. Spire Motorsports has three or four cars. And the whole plan of the day was to, to stay back there. I mean, I've could, I could have drove up to 10th place and, and wrecked with everyone else, but that wasn't the objective of the day. The objective was to run as many laps as possible. There's green flag pit stops. Um, with the stages there's multiple of them so you know I need experience like that I'm a rookie I don't I don't know you know the best way to do a green flag pit stop so everyone I think everyone's mad because we were running 30th but that was kind of by choice you know you see a few years back where the Joe Gibbs guys in the playoffs at Talladega were they weren't even in the draft they were you know back there hanging out you know for for majority of the race so either way I mean it it just happened to to work out I mean uh, it was a super blessed day to, to be able to go there and make it happen. But um, everyone I've talked to has, you know, said, screw the haters. You know, I got the trophy. <laughs> it's, sitting, uh, it's sitting in my trophy room. So I, I don't care too much. I don't care either. I'm so happy that, you know, somebody was somebody had to take a chance. And I was... A big uh, chance. It was a big <laughs> chance. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I, I guess I think about you as a driver... And, and I know the equipment you're dealing with. Uh, it's no secret. It's not the fastest. But I, I love that you reminded me of Talladega because we were doing a, a social media live streaming at Talladega. And I remember you running up in the front. And Same car. Yeah. And so you, you could have done that, but you followed directions, right? Yeah, it was so hard. They said, uh, they said just ride around in the back all day, let everyone wreck. We'll come away to the top ten. I was like, oh, come on, I really want to race. But but I raced in the Xfinity race the, a few nights before, and, you know, I finished second. And, you know, it's just uh, at the end of the day, you want to race, but you want to get the best finish possible. And no matter how that comes about, you, you still as a race car driver want to do your team proud, family proud, your sponsors proud. And, and wrecking that car, you know, 15 laps in the race wasn't going to do that. It wasn't the objective. So, um, like I said, at the end of the day, it, it's what we came to do. I mean, it's what we were supposed to do, and it's how God made it happen. I mean, uh, it was his plan. And you, you you couldn't help it if everybody pitted in front of you. That, that, no, no, but, I can't help that. <laughs> so you didn't have anything to do with that, yeah. right? I, I was joking around with some people that, <laughs> that Kurt won this weekend, right? I said, man, I wasn't there to steal from him again. <laughs> no one really thought I was funny except myself. But. Uh, I think it's pretty funny. But, you know, I'm happy for you, and I'm happy for, for the team. And I love Jay Robinson. Jay's a, Jay's a good dude. And I know uh, Premium Inspire have a, a working relationship. And, and, and Jay Robinson, he's, he's all in in NASCAR. And, I, I appreciate him, but I think I think the guy I'm most happiest for 
well, it's hard to say because your your name will go down as a winner in Daytona. So I'm I'm really thankful for that. But but Peter Suspenzo, your your crew chief, I mean he he out called him. You know, at, at, when when it all came down to the end, he was the one that made the call that won the race, and I'm so happy for him. He's been around forever and yeah. won some races, and he he was a Penske guy, you know. So you thought of him as like this buttoned up cat, and and they won races, and and now he is. I think he's in his 60s, and to be able to have this opportunity and to 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 call the race that eventually got you to victory lane, that was pretty cool. Yeah, I, I think it's cool because Spire Motorsports is kind of. A, piece together team right now uh they started late december which is insane to start a cup team i mean it's almost impossible um and and no one really wants to go work for a startup cup team that uh you know only has three cars i mean it's hard to find guys so peter taking a chance going over there and, and working there i mean i was just so happy for for all the crew guys i mean the pit crew is a piece together pit crew from uh from a school i mean it was just you know i've won races but but they never have and i know peter has but um i just think all of it coming together like i said it it, i think it meant so much more than than just a win i think it uh you know made it made a lot i'm no it made my life i mean that my life's almost completed now um in the racing aspect of it so that's uh, awesome i think a lot of other people uh can agree and and that's so great to hear but but your your path is to to be in a cup car, in a competitive car you, you climb in every Sunday and think you can win in. I, I just I guess it's hard for me to to process what it must be like for you to have gotten this this out of order. Like it, it got all messed up for you. Well, it wasn't supposed to. I had <laughs> I had a perfect opportunity last year at Daytona, uh, and I threw it away in the Xfinity race. So we'll we'll get a, an Xfinity one soon enough. I mean. Uh, like you said, I've won a K&N race, I've won an ARCA race, I've won truck races, I've won a cup race, but Xfinity thing's the only, the only thing I'm missing, so. Uh, well, you've only been at it for six months. Yeah, I know. I got plenty of time. I was only at the cup, <laughs> at it on a cup race for like one race, so I don't know what else I can do, but uh, obviously the, the cup win was, was super fortunate, and like I said, I mean, that stuff doesn't happen too often, so um, we're fast in the Xfinity car with college racing. No doubt. And, and uh, like you said, we're consistent, and we're becoming consistently fast. And um, I think that's where we're killing them right now. I talked to your crew chief or team manager, Chris Rice, today and, and asked him a couple of questions about about you and about what what impressed you the most. And, and I think it was interesting to me to hear him say, like I talked about earlier, and I, I want you to expand upon this, you're, you're, you were a dirt racer and a road racer. How, how as a 20 year old kid, do you have that type of experience? What were, I know we've talked about, uh, Todd Braun, your uncle was, was he a, a big part of, of planning out how you would get ready to come NASCAR racing? So, so Todd's always given me the opportunity and, and set up the deals in the NASCAR world. He's always been the guy that, that gets me the team owners, you know, information and he puts it together, but there's another uncle in the equation, uh, and his name's Drew. Uh, he's Todd's brother and, and my uncle. And um, so I grew up racing dirt cars around Indiana, um, non-wing mini sprints and stuff like that. You know, growing up in India, that's what you do. You, you dirt race. So um, there's a there's a time where I started Canaan in racing, and Canaan obviously has road courses, mm-hmm. and Arc has road courses, and, and trucks got road courses. So Canaan has dirt too, doesn't it? <clears throat> yeah, but never when I was around that. I don't think it's in the West. It's only in the West series, not the East. But mm-hmm. anyway, my other uncle Drew said, hey, we need to put them in um, in some of these sports car races with Trans Am. It just happened that Mike Cope was running a building from him uh, down in Florida because that's where he lives. And it, it was all, you know, meant to be. So uh, my uncle was like, hey, you know, if he's going to become a NASCAR racer, he's going to have to get at road courses too. So he set me up with Michael Self, Mike Cope Racing, and uh, Drew Brown Motorsports and kind of put this deal together. And I went out and, and ran some races and had some fun and, and became a sports car racer and, and ran for the Trans Am Championship in 2016. Uh, finished third in points. It was the same year I won the Canaan East Championship. I'm not great at math. How old were you in 2016? Uh, 17. Yeah, 99, you, you're, 17. You are racing against grown-ups, right? Yeah, yeah, especially in that series. So, um I don't know, but between my uncles and, and my mother and my stepdad, uh, they've they've set me up with everything I need to succeed and, and you know 
I'm glad I have so far. Yeah. Or else I'd be letting a lot of people down. <laughs> you really delivered for them. But your stepfather, he he would drive you from race to race, right? He was a big part of this whole plan too. Yeah, yeah. So my stepdad has never missed a race except for Sonoma this year. Uh, he went on a family vacation. But every single race I've ever been at, uh, my stepdad has attended and, mm. and supported me. And, and he's the one that got me not started in racing, but um, – I don't know. I kind of have an unconventional start to racing. It wasn't like my parents pushing me. I, I was pushing my parents. Um, even though Todd and, and my grandparents were in racing, um, no one really pushed me. It was kind of like one of those deals where one day I woke up and was like, hey, like, kind of want to drive a quarter midget. And my mom was like, okay, well, convince your stepdad and you guys can go ahead if he how, says how yes. How old were you then? Five or six? No, I was nine. Like uh-huh. I said, I mean, so there was, late you started. Yeah, there late. was no push. I mean, I just I don't woke up one day. so soon. <laughs> right. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I convinced my stepdad, and the rest is history. But th- there was no one pushing me. Like it was just this is my own deal. Like this is my own dream, my own passion, and and obviously it's shaped around uh, my families as well. But um, it's pretty crazy. Well, t- um, your your truck race in Canada that was that was a cool day for you, right? Yeah, for sure. And tell me tell me tell me what you remember about that that day. So I remember I was really mad that day because uh last year was the first year with delmar motors in the truck series and we went to canada and kbm had went up there and tested the open motor or you know whatever they called yeah. them to the Elmar motor and the open motors had a a, a nice gear that was right. that would run a little bit better than the elmores and they were about a second quicker than us all day and i was so mad i was like man i went to the nascar hauler even i i personally wanted to go to the nascar hauler and i was like man we're gonna get our asses you know and they're like well we can't do anything about it we're already at the track i'm like okay so we qualified in the rain which leveled it out but then we got to the race and i'm telling you the open motors those the kbm and the hattori truck were just gone and me and john hunter were the chevys with ilmores and we just couldn't catch them we couldn't catch them so all day i I was so mad so mad because i was just getting out motored and then uh you know, I was happy at the end of the day because I won. But uh, and, and let me ask you about that. You your road racing background. You went to Canada thinking I'm I'm going to beat these guys. Yeah. And you get to Canada and you find out that because of the the rules, someone had what almost appeared to be an insurmountable advantage over you. That yeah. that's why you were so frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. And and NASCAR does a great job of, of leveling the the playbook and. I think most most times it is. I mean, there wasn't really too many times that we showed up last year and it was a huge advantage, but um, it was the only truck race that was a road course and it was up in Canada. You, you can't go test Canada all that often. So, you know, they were kind of put in a, in a blind spot and uh, KBM did their research and found out what motor was going to be better and, and props to them. But uh, at the end of the day, I, I got lucky again. Yeah, what, what a... Wow, that's funny you said that because I've always... I always felt like I was the luckiest guy in the world because, you know, getting winning races, be, getting opportunities is huge. And while you were lucky in Canada, like you were in Daytona, you 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 put yourself in that position. It, it feels good to feel lucky, though, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, I feel like a lot of times uh, in racing, it's not football you know you don't there's not a 50 50 chance you you win or lose you you lose so much more than than you win in this sport and i think that's that's what hard, is hard about it i mean there's there's so many more times that you wake up out of bed and you're like man you know you gotta drag yourself out of bed because you know you finish 10th or, or there's the odds of winning in nascar are so much less than the other sport which which truly makes it the hardest sport in the world so when you do win you you feel lucky and and getting this opportunity, you talked about your family. Uh, it, it's just I, I really appreciate how um, thankful you are and and humble and and also thinking okay, it's a wor- it's working out. I'm I'm a part of it, but maybe there's more to this. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a bigger plan. I remember back when I was running dirt cars. Um, here's another story for you, real quick. So I was running dirt cars, and me and my mom were working on our our open wheel dirt car in the garage one night and I looked at her I was like mom you know this is just I mean I was literally just a kid in Indiana I mean I didn't care if my uncle had owned NASCAR teams none of that mattered I mean it was just us sitting on our own property doing our own thing and I was like I just want to start one truck race I just start one truck race like I'll go sit in office job whatever I'll be the happiest guy (laughs) alive you know and then 
you know, you start one truck race. I actually started my first truck race on my mom's uh, 40th birthday uh, at Bristol, which was my grandmother's favorite track. So I remember talking to you that day. Yeah. That was fun because, I mean, you're not. You're not very old now, but man, you yeah. you were you I were, was but like sixteen maybe. Yeah. I remember asking you what you thought and you're like, Well this place is pretty fun and I don't know what to think really. Yeah. It was fun to see you you're more confident now, you can tell as a, obviously you're a cup winner and you've also had so much success, but but I just liked how how wide open your eyes were that day and and I wish I had known that story about you and your mom working on that that dirt car and telling her that you know your yeah. goal was to start you you would just start one truck. I didn't care where I finish. Yeah, just start. Just take the green flag in a truck race, not a cup race. Not, I mean, Cup and Xfinity wasn't even in, in my realm of thinking back then. When I started, I, I mean, it just wasn't even feasible. So to to see how it all kind of shapes and, and changes and what a little hard work and and a lot of blood and sweat and a lot of tears can do. You know what's interesting? You're, you, I think you wound up in a really cool place with Matt Collig and Chris Rice and Collig Racing. The um, the progress that that they're making and 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 the the infrastructure, the the the, the team they're building that you might not have to go anywhere to to become a cup racer. That that might be the the, the slope that those guys are on. How's that feel for you to be a part of that team and, and a part of their roots, so to speak? Yeah, well, you know, I was at GMS Racing, which is a powerhouse organization. I mean, they have 120-plus employees, so many people. And and when I got a call from, from Chris Rice and Matt Colleague, um, it was actually after my Daytona Xfinity win uh, last year, um, it was it was it was <laughs> it was cool to go over there. Like so, you talked to them about your Daytona Xfinity win, and then he's well, talking about his one two three finish this year at Daytona. Yeah. So when the whole deal came about, I was like, man, it's a small team. Like that's kind of cool. Like I I kind of want to be part of a small team. Like all the focus on me. You know, um, I like attention. So I was like, man, you know, it's kind of my feel. It's kind of my vibe over there. And um, when it all came about, I mean, I was just super excited and and being a part of a program that's growing and and the one two three daytona i mean there's so much excitement like i wanted to get matt's first win for him but i was just as happy that that someone else got matt's first win for him because the guy just puts so much heart and love into the sport and and just gives us all so much at college racing we only have 20 something employees and we ran three cars and it was a big stretch for us so to perform on that level like we did um it was it was unbelievable and and I think a lot of the emotion poured out. I mean, we had our own like celebration on pit road, like afterwards, like everyone was like <laughs> hugging and NASCAR was yelling at us get away from the cars, but we were just having a good time. So uh, it's been a cool ride for sure. So Matt, being a Midwestern guy, you're a Midwestern guy. You come to NASCAR and and uh, you're you're doing a great job. Do you have any idea about what 2020 might look like, or, or are you just going to finish, keep racing this year? Do you have a plan for next? Yeah, so I was lucky enough when me and Matt had our talks, and I was winning truck races right around the, the mix of it, and Matt likes winners, so uh, <laughs> he actually signed me on to a two-year contract for nice. the Xfinity Series, and uh, th- so that was cool to, to know that you have a job for, for not only a year, but you know, this is about the time where silly season, everything else starts, and you got to start looking for another job. So it's, it's really stressful on, on a race car driver, which you know, um, and having that to your contract and, and being able to, you know, not have to go out and just run my heart out and make mistakes. I can kind of build up to it knowing that I have two years to, to develop and grow and, and get wins. But you have to be confident in where, you, like, if, if it was a one-year deal, you'd be thinking – all right, I'm I'm probably going to get signed back up because you've done a nice job in the Xfinity Series. That's been fun, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, like I said, uh, me and Nick Harrison, we took a little while to mesh um, just because he's got so much experience and I don't have any uh, in the Xfinity cars. And, and the biggest thing for me is is the trucks are kind of easier to drive. I mean, they are easier to drive, but if you have a good truck in practice, you're going to have a good truck in qualifying. You're going to have a good truck in the race. Races are shorter. I mean, practice is normally right around the race time. These Xfinity cars take a huge swing from practice to the race. So even in qualifying, we, we struggle in qualifying every week. We might have a 5th, 6th, 7th place car in practice, and we'll qualify 15th just because our balance is just the slightest off. So that's been the biggest thing for me is unloading at a track that I've only raced twice at, maybe once at, in a truck, and, and going out there with the best of the Xfinity series and, and having to keep up. 
um, while helping Collier Racing build and and uh, and everything else. So it's definitely been um, I wouldn't say tough, but it's uh, it's been eye opening. It's it's a lot bigger step from the Truck Series to the Xfinity Series than than uh, I thought it would be. Now everybody's talking about the big three in the Xfinity Series. How does that affect you? Knowing you got three guys that have stepped up and have proven week in and week out they're the guys to beat and if you look at the 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 speed chart or if you look at the results a lot of times they're they're one two three does that motivate you to to say okay there's more of us out here the biggest thing about that for a rookie right this is my first i'm not even my first season at xfinity series i mean i'm like halfway through it cole custer has been in it for multiple years christopher bell has 14 or something wins tyler reddick's been in it for four or five years they, they've all been in the xfinity series for three, four, five years a piece and it and it took them a while to develop. You know, they you know, I know Christopher went out and, and won right away, but Reddick and Custer took a while and mm-hmm. and it, it takes a while to, to develop and, and especially with college racing trying to develop too. I mean, uh that's why I like the two year contract so much because you know, a lot of them just don't go out and win, uh, right off the bat unless you're Justin Haley in the Cup series. But um you know, it you gotta develop and grow and that's the biggest thing. It, it doesn't happen overnight. And it's interesting to hear you say that because I think college racing is going to grow. Uh, the 10 car is going to run more this fall with some, maybe Austin Dillon's going to drive it and Ross is going to drive it and AJ on the road courses. You talked about it being a smaller team. Do you think that will help the the development process, the growth process of the team? Or are you a little bit worried about it getting distracted from you, the focus? No, I think Chris Rice and, and everyone over there does a great job of of keeping the 11. Um, you know, I, I think they're both equal cars. I don't think one's better than the other. I, I think at the end of the day, um, I wish the 16 would have pulled over at Daytona. But uh, <laughs> it, it's Ross Chastain. I mean, he's got to win, too. He's got to prove himself. So um, there's no team orders. There's no one's better than the other. I mean, like I said, the guys that build my car are, build the sister car. I mean, we all build each other's cars. It's not like there's one team and two team like it's everyone for college racing and that's what i like about it i mean uh some of those other teams you go over there and they're like completely separated not even in the same shop but uh our cars get built side by side on jack stands and and my guy will put the radiator in my car you'll put the radiator in that car so not at all i see it as a plus i see austin coming over and ross coming over and aj uh it's been nothing but positive and and you you can't you know go over there and and the experience and, and what they bring to the table uh, means so much. And especially with Tyler Reddick, he's basically a teammate. I mean, he's as close to a teammate as you can get without being in the same right. same building. I mean, we have debriefs. We have, I mean, he literally, all of our meetings are, are with him. And, and leaning on him has been my, my biggest thing. Uh, he's become a really close friend, and we have similar driving styles with our dirt background. So having Tyler come in and obviously a, a past champion in the Xfinity Series, and, and he's hot right now. Um, that's been really big for me too. And it, it probably helps validate whether it's Tyler or Ross, things you're thinking and you say, yes, I feel that I see that. And it's got to build confidence in you that you know the same feelings that they're talking about. Yeah. So there's a point there where me and Nick Harrison, my crew chief, were kind of off on our own deal and it really wasn't working. And Tyler was really hot. So I, me and Nick came together one Monday and we're like, we'll just put Reddick setup in. We'll just steal his setup, note for note, put it in your car, see how you run. And this was Charlotte weekend. So we practice about the same speed. Uh, so we do both practices, and after final practice, we'll have our big meeting with RCR. And we go in there, and we have the same exact complaints, which we normally do anyway. Um, and that was our best finish of the year with fifth uh, at that point. Um, we'd run seventh a few times, but it, it was just a, a pickup in speed. So to, to validate that for me, that I could throw his setup in, he won that race, and I finished fifth, but um, it, it definitely helped for sure. Well, a lot of big moments, obviously Daytona. What what um, what are your three favorite Justin Haley moments so far in your career? Uh, I would say um, probably my first truck win because that that validated a lot for me. Um, you know, you win in the Canaan Series, you win in the Arca Series, but when you get that first truck win on on a national touring series, uh, I I think it it did a lot for me. It gained my confidence and and whatnot. Um, my second biggest one would be my cup debut at Talladega on my birthday. Uh, that was pretty cool. And then obviously my cup wins. Yeah. So, um, 
they they're all pretty recent within the past year, but definitely my biggest. And and as a kid growing up, you you raced the dirt cars, you raced some some Trans Am, and you raced ARCA with with my buddy Ken Ken Schrader. Um, did did do you remember those moments when you looked at Ken Schrader and thought, oh wow, you, you know you're you could be my grandpa. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no, I never thought that, but uh, he's just always been straight up with me, and that's what I liked, and I was always straight up with him, and he probably thought I was some kid, you know, running some nice ARCA car and was going to wreck him, but I I may have, I don't know, but we run dirt modifies together every so often now um, with our lethal chassis and, and Kenny Wallace and David Strimmey and all them guys, so when, uh, when we did race ARCA back in the day, I, I just thought it was cool, I mean, uh, he probably didn't, but I, I just looked up to him and, and thought all of his accomplishments were, were somewhere I wanted to be someday. It's interesting because as a kid, I looked up to Kenny Schrader, too, if that tells you how old he is. That, no, that... I don't know how old he is, <laughs> but I don't want to know. Uh, but it, you talked about the lethal chassis and Kenny Wallace and Kenny Schrader. I, I watched those cars run at Eldora. I, I can't believe how wide open you are. Like how hard you drive those cars? What what do you what is it like to to go down in the corner, the the left rear is traveling this far, yeah, and and you're whoop, whoop. not even that. I mean, when you qualify a UMP car at, at Eldora, most of the time you're wide open if the track's right. But I, I've always had this like perception of racing when at least I do, when you're in the car, you're so focused that it doesn't feel that fast. And I, I'm sure you, you feel the same. Like when you get out of the car and you're watching like the same class run, you're like, oh my gosh, are we really going that fast? And I, I've always had that crazy perception, you know, when you get out of the car and you look and you're like, Ooh, you know, but, um, it, I mean, it just, you're just driving. I mean, that's all it is, is it, anything you get in it, it might be faster or slower, but at the end of the day, you're, you're still just a race car driver. Is Eldora one of the best dirt tracks? Yeah, yeah, I've uh, I've had some success there. I don't like trucks there. I was never too good there, but in a UMP car, when you're when you're running the fence or whatnot, uh, it's extremely fun. What's another great dirt track somewhere around the Midwest that that was is fun to go to and watch? Um, Kokomo. Kokomo is pretty cool. Uh, always had some. I, I've never run there, but um, I I grew up 45 minutes from there and never ran there. But a track that I've always wanted to run is Terre Haute. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was never allowed to because it's too big, too fast, and, and whatnot. And and several people have gotten hurt there. But there, there's some good dirt tracks up in Indiana that I would like to go hit. Um, maybe in my later years, like like Kenny Schrader does. Yeah, he does a good job of that. Um, Shady Bowl, you ever race there? I have not. I'm gonna go there this weekend. Is it dirt? No, or it's asphalt? pavement. Oh. So you ever heard of the Vores Compact Touring? Oh suit? yeah. So they they built me a car. And no, what, you're driving? Yeah, I'm going to race. Oh, I thought you were racing. <laughs> no. The Vors car. Yeah. So, the, the, hang on, backstory. I would do, like, the Winchester 400 and, and all that stuff with the, with the CRA guys, late model racing, and they would bring these Vors cars in on, like, you know, the, you know when a, a hauler pulls up to, like, a car dealership with all the cars? That's what they bring them in on, like, stacked full, like, 10 of them, unload them, and they would, like, flip them around Winchester. There were, like, 40 of them starting so they, five wide. They flip? Yeah, well, I've seen multiple flip before. But. All right, they didn't tell me that. Ah. So la- so what, how <laughs> this happened was last fall I went to their banquet. Yeah. And I, you know, spoke, told some stories, presented trophies, and we got done. We started drinking beer. And most good stories, you know, don't don't start with we had a cup of tea. Yeah. We were drinking beer, and they're like, oh, you got to come race with us. So I told them I started in a mini stock in Kentucky in 1981. That was that was my first season, and I won the championship. I said, if y'all can build me a car that looks like that, I'll come race. And so they built me a Toyota Celica that I'm going to go race Shady Bowl this weekend with. And this is the best part. If it goes good, and I like it, and it's fun, they're racing Friday night after the trucks at Eldora. Really? So I, I'm going to get to race Eldora. But now I'm reconsidering. The Boars are running Eldora? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. So the I don't know if he runs it or not. But the little guy, there's a, he was always cool to me. I think his name's Steve Vore, maybe. Yeah, Steve. Yeah. Right. Yeah, real little. Yeah, hey, shorter we, I used to, I can say that because he always <laughs> would joke to me because I'm real little and he's shorter than me, but. Now, are um, you going to get taller or do you think you're done? No, I think I'm done. Uh-huh. But the guy that runs that, Steve Vore, who created it, uh, he was always extremely nice to me. So He is awesome. Yeah. And do you remember Dad, Dan Redman? Maybe a little bit. Yeah, he, he Probably kinda, could see his face and remember he runs it. it. So anyway, I've got. My car, 
um, paint it up just like it did in, in 81. I'm going to fly to Ohio on on Friday. I'm going to make some laps Friday afternoon in it, and then the race is Saturday night. Are you nervous? Yeah, I'm very nervous because <laughs> I, they interviewed me. They said, no, you know, it's just like getting back on a horse or bicycle or whatever they call it. But, yeah, I'm going to – there's like 30 of them. That's what I'm saying. When well, they, what if when I run 30th? That's going to suck. Uh, well, I don't know. I go into every weekend, and there's there's 30-plus cars, so I yeah. could run 30th every weekend. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, so there's a couple weekends off as we race toward uh, Miami. Are you going to run any dirt races or do any sports car racing, or is it just focus on your, on your um, Xfinity series? Well, the Xfinity series is on like a 15-week stretch right now, which uh, extends to, to sometime in November, I, I believe. Um, so there's not, there's no off weekends for a while. Um, but there is a weekend, Bristol weekend. I think we race on Friday. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to run my dirt car locally, um, around here on on that Saturday. So, um, not too many times. I know that that after the Indy race, um, there's a dirt race in, uh, Putnamville on a Sunday that I'm going to go watch my girlfriend. She runs a dirt modified as well. So, um, wow. I'm going to race Saturday at the big track and then go watch her run her dirt car. How she, do you help her? Do you give her tips or is she, no. uh, is she all right? I, I've never seen her race, but <laughs> uh, I tend to stay away. And the, the thing about it is uh, she races up in Indiana. So uh, normally she races on Saturday and I race on Saturday. So we don't get to correlate a lot, but um, that weekend will be pretty cool. Yeah, fun. So I will tell you this, Justin. I do not like, I'm not a fan of Twitter. Like if Twitter just went away, it wouldn't bother me any. Same. Because there's like mean people on there. Too many. Right. So I'm not mean. No. I don't. I don't like Twitter. I don't think you're mean. Thank you. So anyway, I, I pulled some stuff up on Twitter. Um, I didn't, but someone asked me to ask you this. Um, I've been involved in two of the most controversial finishes ever at Daytona. Love me or hate me, you're all talking about me. So I'm just trying to be myself. That's. That's a great way to look at things, right? I'm just Justin. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's just how it's played out. Like I said, uh, the controversial Daytona Xfinity finish, um, my second ever Xfinity race, it was, uh, I think, one of the biggest. And then, obviously, um, Daytona didn't have to be controversial, but all the mean people made it. So, um, good (laughs) for them. It's not controversial to me. I thought it was incredible. No, me neither. I got the trophy. I should have brought it. I mean, I I still got it. Oh, man. Yeah. No no one's taking it from me. We messed up. We should have that here. Damn it. Oh, well. Um, Talk to me one second about 2018 when you made that move to to pass those guys. Um, Obviously, you look back and say, well, damn, I could have stayed over to the right a little bit. But but running 190 miles an hour coming to the checkered, what, what, tell me about that move. That It was a beautiful move. Yeah, thank you. But th- it was just a lot happening. Um, I was trying to – most of it was looking in my mirror trying to figure out where the where the push was going to come from. And, and um, I didn't know my spotter. It was just some guy that stood up on the roof that weekend <laughs> that I had never even heard. Um, so, you know, you, you – carry yourself a little bit in that aspect but i was just trying to figure out where the push was and i yanked the wheel so i i felt like i needed to go left because larson was on the high side and i felt like if i would have stayed high then uh larson spotter would be like hey you know move outside and it would have been easier for him so uh i felt like i just needed to do something unpredictable like i mean it happened in like two seconds Mm -hmm. like it was like okay it's over um you're going 109 mile an hour so when i yanked the wheel like it got so far you know left that i couldn't really recover from it without wrecking and then elliot kind of came over a little bit and i came over a bit but what happened was the left sides there's a crease where the banking and the apron meet it'll pull you over and it pulled my car over and like i tried to turn right and i couldn't so as soon as my left sides got hooked on that like i couldn't do anything about it i mean i probably could have been a little bit farther over i mean i definitely could have been looking back on it but at the time uh just my left sides got hooked and there was nothing i could do so you took the check. You think I won Daytona. You do your burnout. When when did you first get word that uh, that maybe things weren't all exactly what you thought they were? <laughs> oh, I I didn't care. I I unhooked my radio. I was like, you know what, I won. So uh, I unhooked my radio like on the backstretch for some reason. I don't know why, but apparently they told me on the backstretch that I lost, and I still came around and did a burnout, which to me is you know pretty cool. I I probably would have done a burnout anyway. Um, but I was doing my burnout, and I was like, yeah not really feeling it there was just something inside me that was just like 
maybe I didn't win. But I just like it just didn't feel right. No one had told me, right? My radio was unhooked. I was just in there by myself, like I had been for the past three and a half hours. Uh, racing's kind of lonely, you know. You're just sitting in that little yeah. space for forever. But then Larson started doing his burnouts, and I was like, okay, well, uh oh, probably not good. Another so, guy. Yeah. so uh, that that's when I realized it. You know, when racing's it's really lonely, and and sometimes you feel like you're ten foot tall and bulletproof because you got this button. You can push this button and say whatever you want, and that's why Fox has a radio sweetheart. Yeah. And and people say some crazy stuff. Have you ever won the radio sweetheart? Have you ever lost your mind, or do you stay no. pretty cool? No, I am. Uh, I feel like I'm probably the coolest guy on the radio. I just don't get mad. Like if it happens, it happens. There's nothing I can do about it, right? If someone wrecks me, cool, happen, move on. Like nothing I can do. I'm not Johnny Sauter. Um, I love Johnny, and and he's one of my best friends. But it's just not how, how I am. Um, I feel like I'm pretty cool headed, and I, I just don't see a reason to to get riled up. That kind of reminds me of Jimmy Johnson, and it's worked out pretty good for him. Yeah. I, don't, I don't ever see him losing his mind. Yeah, we'll see. A <laughs> uh, couple more tweets, and you took a screenshot of your text to to your crew chief Peter, and it says on on um, it says on Monday, July first. So on on um, on Monday before the Daytona race, uh, you ask Peter, "When's the Daytona winner going to be ready for me to set in?" And he said, "Tomorrow about two. And you said, "Okay, I'll see you then, brother." Um, that's that's good foreshadowing. Yeah, I. I just feel like I always try to amp up my yeah. I always try to amp up my team. Right. You know, you, you text Peter like that. You don't. They don't go to the racetrack and expect to win. But um, I feel like it, if I'm the driver that comes in, that I need to tell them that I'm still here to win a race. Like I'm getting in the car. I want to win. So I, I think maybe I don't think I texted that ever to to him in the other two starts. I think that was the only one. But uh, I don't know. I think they had confidence in me, and I had confidence in them, and and. Uh, I mean, the car could have fallen apart like five yeah. laps into the race, and we, mean, we could have lost it. So, um, getting back to the controversy, I mean, I don't know why people are so so hateful. I mean, the the car stayed together and ran the whole time and kept in lead draft. I mean, but uh, no, it was cool. I, I didn't even realize it. He uh, he sent me a screenshot of it, and I was like, man, that is pretty cool. I said that. I didn't even, didn't even realize. That's so cool. So you talk about you talked about keeping your cool. Um, have you ever had anyone lose their cool toward you? Have you? Oh, yeah. Ha- have you ever thought you might be getting ready to get beat up? Yeah, so I was like 15 running a Canaan West Cart Sonoma, and, and uh, there was a late race. It was a green-white checkered, and, and I don't even think I hit him, but Brandon McReynolds spun out, and I actually think it was Noah Gragson that hit him, but I was just kind of the guy that he saw. Um, I may have him. I don't know, but um, – he picked me up and, and grabbed me on, on pit road and threw me down and um, didn't take long before my entourage got to him <laughs> and, and my team. But, uh, yeah, I, I was only like 15, like I said. I mean, I was barely out of preschool and, and out there with the big boys. And uh, since then, I haven't had any close encounters. But um, that day I thought I was for sure going to die. Did you? Yeah. I and thought... then they made me go talk to him afterwards. After it all happened, they're like, hey, you need to go talk to him and – sort things out i'm like man i'm like 15 like he's big did you did you take your entourage with you just to be- no no it was just me and him <laughs> and, and me and brandon are, are good no, friends he's a great now. Dude. yeah he's a he's a really good guy um uh, really down to earth and and uh he, he's cool to see around the racetrack every so often so glad i got all that worked out so then there's this one day that i was racing at loudon and i think i was running fifth seventh eighth whatever top 10 and Robbie Gordon he was running good too and he came down into turn one and you know how loud it is he he hooked the bottom and he just drove up into the side of me and and knocked me out of the way and I don't know why a lot of times you race with people and they do that and you just say all right well don't do that again or you you get over it or whatever but I didn't get over it and when he slid up I turned him and he clobbered. He went across that grass on the back straightaway mm-hmm. and clobbered that inside wall. And I came back around under caution. And, you know, when you said you thought that Brandon McReynolds was going to hurt you, Robbie Gordon, I was in a race car strapped in. But I could tell that he was he wanted to hurt me bad. And he took his helmet and he threw a perfect strike at my door and bounced his helmet off of my car. And, and to this day, when I see Robbie Gordon – He's a nice dude. Mm-hmm. And I just think to myself, that's what a race car can do to you. It, it can just get you so 
riled up. And and to be able to to figure out how to deal with all those emotions, whether it's somebody mad at you or you're mad at someone else, that's that's really important. And we talked earlier about Jimmy Johnson, how he seems to be really cool. How are you able to keep your cool when when someone crosses you? Well, well don't get me wrong. I've I've been pissed off once or twice, but uh, usually it's pretty early in the race that, that I don't have to deal with. And I've never been on the short end of the stick too many times. Most of the time I'm I'm more uh, mad at the officiating series or, or the people running the, the race. And, and that's not only NASCAR. I mean, that goes for every dirt track or, or sports car race I do. I mean, just a lot of the calls um, in any sport you, you tend to not like when, when you're on the short end of them. So I don't know. I, I just think it's uh, how I was born. I was just – I just feel pretty calm, and like I said, it's uh, it's God's plan. It's what He's going to do, and at the end of the day, I can't control it. There's more power to you. Are are you going to run Talladega in the fall? No, no. They uh, there were some talks about me running some other Cup races, and I was like, I'm done. There's no way. Uh, <laughs> you, you you pulled the plug, huh? Yeah, I felt bad, but I was like, man, uh, maybe sometime down the road when when I'm not focusing on an Xfinity Championship and trying to get that one over there, but. Uh, it's okay. I, I made a mistake and won a cup race. And yeah, you messed up. Fortunately, I've made bigger mistakes than that, and, and this is a mistake I can forgive myself for. Great episode of Waltrip Unfiltered. We appreciate you listening. We also ask that you please give us a five-star rating. We're needy. I know it. And also tell your friends that via their favorite podcast app, they can add us and listen to our great stories from Young racers like Justin Haley. Justin was so fun. He's been through so much. He was on the perfect glide slope straight to cup, and he screwed it all up and won at Daytona in the Monster Energy Cup Series. How cool is that? I'm so happy for that young man. Appreciate his heart, his spirit, and also all that he means to this sport. These are the kind of folks that I want y'all to get to know, people that truly love getting to race. Like he told his mom when he was 9 or 10 years old, I just want to start a truck race. Well, that all worked out pretty well. So thank you for listening. Next week, we're going to have another great show. We're going to break down everything that happens in New Hampshire. We're going to get us some lobsters. We're going to get some crab cakes. And we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to come back and tell you all about it. Thanks so much for listening. And we'll talk to you next week.